Hey, I'm back. Bicho Feo here with another segment of Cheap Heat. Cheapies that shred. Records that can be had inexpensively and will bring you great joy, hopefully. I'm going to discuss records from the 80s for the most part. Um, these kind of are, cover a variety of genres, mostly in the jazz realm, and they're all from the 80s. And I I was alive during the 80s for, an ex for the whole 80s. <laughs> I hated the 80s. I really did. I hated the keyboard sounds. I hated the clothes. Although, I secretly lusted after a pair of Z Cavaricci jeans, if you know what I'm talking about. Um, I did have a skinny leather tie, and I did have a mullet. I even had a rat tail for a while. So I did participate in the 80s, but um, I'll never like the cars. I'm sorry. As much as I admire Rick Ocasek, I'll never like the cars. The whole new wave thing, I just never got into it. The Pretenders were good, but you get what I'm saying anyway. I'm not an 80s guy. I'm much more a 70s guy. Anyway, let's talk about music instead of me. Um, this record, this, <laughs> this is about cheap records. These are all from the 80s. A couple things were going on in the 80s that were really great. Uh, the whole Harmelotics thing, spearheaded by the originator of Harmelotics, Ornette Coleman, was uh, was really going great guns through the 80s. And it was the source of pretty much all the best music, I think, in jazz in the 80s. It was electric. Um, sure, there was a lot of great acoustic music. But um, the 80s fusion electric scene was marred by smooth jazz, was marred by horrible keyboard sounds. Um, and just a general lack of direction. There were a few bright spots, however. Uh, Material, for example, that, that's a good example of a, of a good 80s band. Um, you can find those records around major label records, though I'm trying to avoid major label and trying to look in the hidden currents and eddies of, of, of music and recorded music at the time. So things that might not be as obvious. Um, James Blood Ulmer recorded a bunch of fantastic records for Columbia in the 80s, which are worth getting. Obviously, Ornette Coleman's records at the time, I think were all great. Um, another guy that doesn't get the kind of credit he deserves is uh, Shannon Jackson. And he recorded these two masterpieces. These are masterpieces of jazz rock fusion. His first record, um, which was on the About Time label, um, I can't remember the title, it had a great uh, Inuit mask on the cover though. That's a masterpiece too. Uh, that'll set you, that might set you back a little bit more than 10 bucks, maybe not though. These two records though could be had pretty cheaply. They're both on the Antilles label. They both got wonderful players on them like Vernon Reed on guitar, Melvin Gibbs on bass, and of course Shannon Jackson on drums. The, comp the compositions are so complicated and wonderful and bizarre. Uh, there's been nothing like Shannon Jackson group, Shannon Jackson's group before or since. And, and I hope that someday he gets his due. Um, what a magical player and composer. What an interesting personality. I wish I had met him. Really one of my musical heroes. Barbecue Dog and Man Dance are two really good places to start if you're not familiar with the music of Shannon Jackson. Great 80s, uh, for lack of a better term, great 80s harmonic jazz rock fusion that can be had for less than 10 bucks. The no wave scene in New York City spawned a number of really interesting uh, phenomena. Uh, the Knitting Factory actually, I think, sprang from the ashes of that scene. Um, but before the Knitting Factory was around, there was sort of a loosely associated group of musicians working in New York City, and they all had sort of a dark vision of music, and they all made albums for small labels. Um, the Lounge Lizards were in that, in that uh, scene. And uh, they're pretty well known, and a lot of their records could be had very inexpensively. Um, I could have brought all those out and talked about those, but I won't. Lounge Lizards, just buy anything you see by them if you don't have it. I'm going to mention a few more, uh, even more obscure things than the Lounge Lizards, though. First up is this record by a guy named Jody Harris, who is a guitar player. This is a really interesting record. One side, he's backed by a sort of neo-ironic surf band called the Ray Beats. Uh, which was pretty popular in the downtown New York area for uh, in the late 70s, early 80s. And there's a little singing on side one, not much, but most of it's this really cool kind of surfy, dark instrumental rock. 
The second side, however, just guitar, bass, and drums. The drummer is Dennis Charles of Cecil Taylor fame. And the bassist is David Hofstra, who later on wound up in the uh, microscopic septet. And Jody Harris on guitar and organ. And it is some dark, dark, drony stuff, man. Let me tell you, very unusual. Nothing like it before since. This album is not expensive. It's on a small label, Press Records. It's called It's Happened One Night. And I uh, love the cover art. It is so cool. And it's just a cool 80s New York artifact. And uh, I play side two a lot. Side one's good, but side two with Dennis Charles and David Hofstra. And just these crazy, drony, uh, reverby guitar sounds. This is great. It's really good. Uh, Miles Davis hadn't come back yet. And uh, you were looking for, if you were looking for that darkness, that album has it. Here's another group in that scene, in that no wave New York scene, uh, Jules Baptiste and Red Decade. Several of these guys went on and formed a band called The Ordinaires. Uh, one of them, Fritz Van Orden, is on this record. Uh, there's a couple of other guys that wound up in The Ordinaires on this record. So it's three saxophones, bass, and drums. And it's only an EP, two, like six, six and a half minute songs per side. Won't cost you much. It's on the same label that did um, Liquid Liquid and uh, Glen Branca Neutral Records, it's called. Anyway, not expensive at all. And uh, really inventive, really unusual. Almost has sort of a Zool, Zoil, however you want to pronounce it, feel to it. Kind of surging, dark, uh, urgent, you know, feel to it. Uh, very aggressive, not tons of soloing, but um, just really unusual dark music that kind of throbs and, uh, and it gets under your skin. And it's a shame it's only an EP. I could have used a lot more of that one. Finally, also in this New York scene, were these guys. These guys were sort of fringe players, the Cubist Tear. And uh, the 20th letter of the alphabet is the name of the album. And it's kind of an odd record. It's almost... It's like really more like a free jazz record than anything else. In unusual instrumentation. On the surface, it's sax, guitar, bass, and drums. Fretless bass played by Daryl Tews, who is sort of a, a bassist on that scene in a bunch of different groups, I think. Um, the drummer's Danny Frankel, who's sort of like the Zelig of the New York downtown scene, was in a bunch of different bands. Um, really good drummer. Never heard of the saxophone player before, Michael Acosta. And the guitarist, Michael, Michael Whitmore, plays exclusively acoustic guitar. And he's like a classical guitarist. But this is sort of a free improvised, scronky uh, setting for him. And uh, it's a really an interesting record. If you're not into free improv or scronky sounds, you might want to avoid this one. But um, it's a really interesting record, and I see it quite often. Um, it's on a small label. It's got kind of a gimmicky cover. Instead of opening like a normal gate folder album does, it, it has this little folder jobby on it. And, and uh, yeah, it's a kind of a neat record. And I, I see it for like five bucks semi-often. It's not a common record, but it is cheap. Also, New Jersey represent. Uh, this is the Thursday group. I just picked this up recently. And... Um, this, this group was led by a guitarist named Doug Leiterman. Yeah, Douglas Leiterman. And he actually ran this label called Pathfinder. Um, who, they, he later on uh, recorded Bill Connors records when he returned to Fusion uh, with Dave Weckl and uh, uh, bassist, I uh, can't remember his name, really good bassist, Tom Kennedy. Anyway, um, Letterman also did his own records. This one has Vinnie Johnson on drums from uh, Brute Force and, uh, and um, oh, God, that Vibes player who did the Hoagie Carmichael record that uh, is worth hundreds of dollars now. They reissued um, Stark, Stark Reality. And uh, he was in Stark Reality. So this record's kind of like, almost like a laid back ECM guitar, saxophone, bass, drums kind of session. It's uh, from 82. It's really good. And it's everywhere for like five bucks. It's not, again, not a common record. It's on a small label, but um, it's quite rewarding. If you're looking for an ECM kind of vibe, and ECM records are a dime a dozen, right? But you want something a little different, um, 
This doesn't get out there. You'd think from the cover, which I love this cover art, you'd think from the cover it'd be pretty incendiary. It's not, it's kind of spacious. And Vinnie Johnson does a really nice job on drums. Uh, what, a, what a great drummer he was. And uh, the bassist and saxophonist I've never heard of before since, but uh, Leiterman went on to record another record with this group, which isn't as good. It's more of a overtly sort of fusion record um, that's kind of, I don't know, it's all right. This one is one to look out for though, it's really nice. I like it quite a bit. Here's the record, I've never understood why this record isn't bigger than it is because it's got so many bizarre connections and it's actually quite good. Zahara is the name of the group. Now this group is led by Roscoe G, the bassist in Traffic and also in Can. And it's also got Rebop, Kwaku Ba on it. It's the last thing Rebop did before he passed away. Um, it's dedicated to his memory. This is from 83. The drummer on this is Richard Bailey from Jeff Beck's group. He's amazing as usual. And there's a keyboard player on here playing pretty much exclusively polyphonic synthesizers. And you, there's a lot of lead bass on this. So you have to like lead bass. Roscoe G really plays his butt off on this. It's actually a lot more like Saw Delight by Can than it is uh, like anything else. Very groovy, um, lots of sort of hanging keyboard, sort of suspended in midair keyboard clouds, and just super groovy bass and drums and congas just locked in. It's a really cool record. I'm surprised that people haven't sampled the crap out of this. Um, and maybe they have, but it's a, it's a really easy to find record. It's on Antilles, so it's not a major label, but it's like a small major affiliated an independent label. And um, I see it around all the time, four or five, six bucks, and it's worth every penny. It's really good. It's kind of unusual, kind of unusual, but it's sort of equal parts jazz, funk, and um, dubby sort of sounding stuff almost. It's, it's really interesting. I like it a lot, and Roscoe G can really play, so, so can the rest of them. What you're listening to right now is this band that did three records in the 80s that I absolutely adore. Um, one of them I've had for a long time, the one that's playing, which is this. This is Eternal Wind. This is their first record. And I, they did two more. And I just assumed they weren't as good. But once again, Christopher Cole said, no, you should get them. So I did. Because um, Chris knows what he's talking about. Uh, and I love them all. This is a great band, Eternal Wind, uh, based in Chicago. And um, on Rounder Records, which might be why they're so inexpensive. You can get these anywhere for five bucks. Fantastic records though. I mean, this, I mean, I don't know if you've been listening. Tune me out and listen to the music. They're that good. Adam Rudolph uh, plays all the percussion on this and drums. He's an amazing musician. In fact, I feel like a lot of the stuff he's doing now with Go Organic Orchestra has its roots in this group. And uh, he might even still be playing with some of these guys. Charles Moore on on uh, brass instruments and Ralph Jones on saxophones and a guitarist I've never heard of before or since named Federico Ramos. Anyway, um, you might remember uh, the two horn players, Moore and Jones, were in Kenny Cox's band and they played on uh, the Strata records as well as the two he did for Blue Note. So these guys come to this music with considerable jazz credentials. Uh, Adam Rudolph is just a total adventurer on percussion. And Ramos is kind of an X-Factor. He plays electric guitar, acoustic guitar, a bunch of uh, exotic stringed instruments. The later records, um, I think the first one's from 84. This is from 88, 86, 87. And this one's from 88. You just don't expect anything really good to be coming out of <laughs> jazz on rounder records from 87 or 88, but actually these are the exceptions that maybe they prove the rule. All, all three of these records are worth having. They will not set you back more than a couple of bucks. Um, none of these set me back a couple of bucks, more than a couple of bucks, and I'm not special in any way, shape, or form. All of them have sort of this world fusion vibe to them, but there's enough jazz going on uh, that they're, they're, they're kind of tough, you know? It's not, it's not new age at all. It's pretty tough music and uh, pretty uncompromised in its own way. And, and the world music sort of elements actually serve to um, make the music better. They add. 
uh, it's not new age gloss. It's not, uh, you know, exotica. It's hard, good improvisational music that comes from different sources. Eternal Wind, any one of their records is a winner. The last group I'm gonna discuss from the 80s, this is all 80s stuff, uh, the SST label did a bunch of really fantastic records in the 80s. This one is by the Universal Congress of, a band that arose out of the ashes of another SST band called Saccharin Trust. This has Joe Baeza on guitar. I think he wrote everything on this as well. Joe Baeza is one of the unheralded guitar warriors of our time. Um, if you like scronky, loud, aggressive guitar, you need to check out the Universal Congress of. Most of their stuff I have on CD. So their stuff kind of crosses over into the CD age. This I have on um, vinyl. I think this is their first one. And uh, it's an EP, I believe. I don't even think it's a full-length record. Fantastic sort of Ornette-inspired uh, hard jazz rock. Um, some of the players played with other SST uh, artists, such as Henry Rollins. I believe Simeon Kane was involved in this band for a while. Um, just a really great band, and Baez is still playing out there in L.A., still doing it, and uh, really just never got his due, in my opinion. Universal Congress of Great Cheap Heat from the 80s, um, if you're looking for some really fierce guitar playing in an improvisational mode. They also did a record uh, where they sort of imitated the cover of This Is Our Music. Um, and they did this decades before uh, 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 that, that group, uh, mostly other people do, do the killing, did it. Um, Universal Congress of did it first. So that's where they're coming from. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this 80s edition of Cheap Heat, of Cheapies That Shred, whatever you want to call it. I hope you gleaned some useful information from it and uh, leave comments below if you have anything nice to say. Thanks a lot.